This food blog radio show is brought to you in part by the Cooking Everything Outdoors show, available on iTunes and YouTube. Hello foodies, this is Gary House with Food Blog Radio, and today I have the great pleasure of having Liz Rubin with me from kosherlikeme.com. Liz, welcome to Food Blog Radio. Hey Gary, nice to be here. Well, thank you for taking your time out to share your life with us. Um, we definitely, uh, for me personally, we're venturing into unknown territory on, on my experience, and I'm really looking forward to your perspective and insight behind your blog. Before we get started on your blog and your work here, tell us a little bit about you and your background. Okay. Well, I'm really an art historian by training, and um, I worked in the visual arts for 20 years, um, um, coordinating gallery shows and uh, doing some PR and marketing for visual artists. I was director of an art gallery in Boston for a number of years. And of course, I always ate like every human. Um, and um, I started when my youngest went off to university, I started doing more research about where I wanted to eat before I just, you know, dropped into a restaurant or went on vacation. And the more research I did, the more I wanted to know about places that would have enough choices for people who are kosher like I am. And so that was sort of the beginning, the seed of an idea a, a, a long time ago. Excellent. So for those that might not really know what kosher is or understand it, perhaps you can share that. Oh, of course. Well, um, the laws of kosher are Jewish laws that are given in the Torah, which are the code of laws that we follow. And they're highly detailed and very, very complex. But I grew up with those laws. I grew up in a kosher home outside of New York City. And when I got married, my husband was not kosher and he just honored the idea of having a kosher home. So I did that. That was over 30 years ago. It was very natural for me. Um, so basically, there are a bunch of laws. We separate milk and meat. So we never eat them together. So there's no such thing as a cheeseburger or eating a hamburger with a glass of milk. And there are a whole bunch of foods um, which by by definition, can never be kosher. For example, shellfish and any uh, products from pig. And then there are a whole bunch of foods which have the potential to be kosher, like any, um, like most parts that would come from um, cow or lamb. But they, in order for them to be kosher, they have to be slaughtered and prepared a certain way. So it's not that I'm thinking about all of these laws and rules all the time. This is just the way I live my life. And thousands and thousands of people have done this for thousands of years. Um, so, you know, I buy kosher food products in my whole food, whole foods market or in the supermarket. And I, and I shop with an organic um, kosher butcher who is not just kosher, but also doing you know, handling his animals the way I'd like them to be handled. So for me, it's not just kosher. It's also that I want my food to be seasonal and organic and farm to table. You know, there are other dimensions like there are for most people. Well, clearly makes sense to me. You, <laughs> yeah. yeah, you started your blog in, I believe, September of 2011. Uh-huh. Yes. And what was the, the impulse behind doing that? <laughs> well, I was writing for a hyper-local food blog here in Connecticut um, for about two years before that. And I approached that editor and said, look, I honor the rules of kosher by avoiding things that are forbidden to me. So when I eat away from my kosher home, I eat as a vegetarian, really a pescatarian. I eat certain acceptable fish and I eat vegetarian. So why don't I write for you as your vegetarian writer? So she said, OK, great. So I exhausted all the vegetarian restaurants in my area in Connecticut in, I would say, four weeks. Um, so then I started um, interviewing chefs who were presenting at my farmer's market who, uh, because of the circumstances where they had to source food from the market itself, what they were preparing was always vegetarian. So that meant that I was comfortable eating it. So I started a series for her site on uh, chef interviews 
who were cooking at farmers markets. Mm -hmm. And then I started eating in rest more restaurants as my life became more flexible when everyone left my home, you know, my kids left. Mm -hmm. And I started eating in restaurants a lot more than I had previously. And I started doing a lot of research about restaurants that had a lot of vegetarian options or vegetarian restaurants were perfect for me, um, of course. But I also wanted to eat in restaurants where the chefs were interested in sourcing things locally and where they had, you know, more than one or two items on the menu that would be appropriate for people who were kosher like me meaning really vegetarian, you know, when I'm away from my home. Mm -hmm. So after writing for someone else for a couple of years, I finally went like, wow, I should really be addressing the needs of a large population of people who might honor the kosher rules the way I do, who are kosher like me. And so I launched my own site and started directing information at people who, who are like-minded eaters. Yeah. It's a beautiful website. It, I you love know. the photos and your Thanks. your articles and topics, and certainly your headlines are very captivating and, and draw your attention to it. So, you. are you the 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 webmaster, if you will, of the website also? Oh yeah, yeah, you oh, do yeah. it all. Yeah, and that was my greatest challenge because you know it was probably two years ago. I mean, two and a half years ago, because I launched a year and a half ago, two and a half years ago, where I really didn't know how to do much. I mean, I was sending emails, you know, and googling, but. Um, yeah, it's been a, a fantastic adventure for me because every day I learn something new about yeah. lots of things. Uh, it, and it changes every single day. <laughs> it does. So, uh, Liz, why don't you take us through a couple of your articles here? Uh, and first off, certainly, let's talk about the one you just posted today of organic. I posted it, I posted it early for you because mm -hmm. you're in California, aren't you? Yes, I am. And this, this post is about a California farmer. And um, well, as I mentioned, I think I mentioned, I, I live in Connecticut. Um, I split my week, believe it or not, each week between New York City and Connecticut. Hmm. And so I have this dual life. Um, I have this great country life and I have a very urban life. Um, but when I'm, when I'm not in New York City and I'm not in Connecticut, I'm out looking for great food events, or if I'm traveling, um, you know, shopping farmers markets and, and meeting people who are involved in the food world. And recently I was at a food conference this fall that was a conference all about sustainable, um, kosher Jewish living. And it's called, the organization is called Kazon. And it gathered people from all over the country. One, and one of the people I met was this woman named Emily Freed whose salt you're looking at on the screen right now, she is a um, farm manager for an organic herb and edible flower farm in Northern California along the coast. And she's responsible for nine farms wow. under the umbrella of organic farms up there. And about, I think two years ago, she launched this product using these organic herbs and other edible ingredients that she grows on those farms. And her product is called Farmer Freed's Culinary Salts. And her story is really interesting. And she was a very uh, cool person. I met her at this conference with a whole bunch of other people from all over the country. So I wanted to highlight her product so that other people could know about it. And you actually did an interview with her throughout this I did an interview with her. I had met her at that conference and then I hadn't spoken to her in a couple of months. Mm -hmm. And when I told her I was ready to write my post, she was quite unwell with a terrible cold. Mm -hmm. So we were, you know, instead of having this easy phone conversation, we did it via email, but she was really responsive and articulate. It was really easy for me to work with her. Uh, and it's, I don't think it's too far from where I live actually. And did I note here that it's, a group of female farmers? Well, the thing that was so interesting about Emily Freed is that she, when she launched her salt products, she had in the back of her mind that she wanted to donate a portion of the proceeds of her products to support other um, organic Jewish farmers in this country who are female. And there are very, very few of them. Mm -hmm. And she made she made it her intention to do that, and um, she's dedicated the pro part of the proceeds of one of her salts 
to a scholarship fund to help cultivate um, organic female Jewish farmers in, in the United States. And she calls that scholarship, You Grow Girl. I mean, she's very clever. It's, a, it's really, ador- really adorable. Yeah. Yeah. Well, kudos to Emily. I think that's fantastic. That's right. You also do restaurant reviews. I do a lot of restaurant reviews because I'd really like to become a resource for people who are traveling so that if they eat like I do and they come to New York City or they come to Connecticut or they go to Aspen or um, any of the places I've been lucky enough to go to, they might click on Kosher Like Me and say, well, where does Liz say I can get some really great food in New York City? So I cover both vegetarian, well, I cover vegetarian and vegan restaurants, and I also cover restaurants that are neither, but that just have a lot of great choices for people who are looking for veg. So what you're looking at here is um, a restaurant review that I wrote last week. The, um, the restaurant, it's really a tiny little cafe off of Union Square in New York City, where there's a fantastic farmer's market four days a week, by the way. Mm. And it's called um, Beyond Sushi. And um, the sushi, you can see these pictures. This Beautiful. is This is the... The restaurant's photographs, they hired a photographer. And of course, you can see I've given credit. I'm always meticulous about giving credit when the photos aren't mine. But here you're looking at um, a six grain uh, rice that the chef uh, uses and um, sweet potato that he seasons and roasts slowly overnight combined with avocado and some beautiful sprouts. So I'm really interested in the perspective of people who are you know, making some really clever connections with their farmers and with seasonal items and with vegetarian, vegetarian goods. I mean, many, many of my readers are vegetarian or just interested in healthy eats. They're not only kosher like me. So um, my readership sort of straddles a population. This food certainly inspires me to skip a cheeseburger. That's for sure. (laughs) Yeah. He calls that it, that wrap is so great. He calls it Nutty Buddy. Yeah, and wow. And got all these ingredients that you would never expect to come together, and they were they were delicious. And, you know, I see you scrolling down to the recipe below that um, post, and, and I'll tell you that uh, this is a recipe from a blogger in Boston uh, who I tapped because – At the end of every post, I'd like to give a recipe so that if my readers can't get to that restaurant, you know, they have a resource or if they're, you know, titillated by the flavors, at least they can walk away and do something um, that will excite them. Some restaurants don't give recipes. And, um, you know, for me, it's it's been um, being a blogger has been very challenging in the best way because I've developed a lot of resources and I've made a lot of friends, you know, cookbook authors and chefs and other writers and bloggers. And this is a blogger who I met at a food conference who comes from Boston. And I was following her for about three years and I finally met her and we're friends now. So when I needed an Asian raw vegetarian recipe, I tapped her and she, of course, she lent it to me. And, uh, and, you know, we all benefit from that kind of sharing. So it's really great. Well, I think it's a wonderful idea. I mean, it just so much, it enhances your blog posts, your articles so much more. Thank you. Yeah, I'm glad absolutely. You- and you also have traditions. I do. I do. So, you know, we're in the Northeast and I know it's warm where you are, but it's really freezing. You know, we're expecting a blizzard tomorrow, by the way. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. And uh, so this is a shot that I took. Um, in honor of a holiday that we celebrated a couple of weeks ago. And um, I would say that, you know, as I look at my editorial calendar, I really, the whole framework is first around Jewish holidays. Mm -hmm. And then after that, um, you know, in a more macro sense, it's around the seasons. And um, so as I factor in the Jewish holidays, this was just a couple of weeks ago, and it's a celebration of um, the holiday. It's really a celebration of the birthday of the trees. And I went out on a warm day in the snow into my backyard here in Connecticut, and I found signs of spring. And, um, and I shot them because that's sort of what the holiday is about. The holiday is called Tu Bishvat. And 
then I thought to myself, gosh, you know, like, how am I going to make this interesting or palpable for people? So, you know, I went into my network of kosher food bloggers and I found someone whose book is being published in about four weeks. And I said to her, you have a recipe that I would love that reflects ingredients that we use and eat when we celebrate this holiday. Would you lend it to me? And again, it's this wonderful crossing over. She was thrilled. She got, you know, some increased traffic and I promote her book and I have a great recipe to provide to my readers in celebration of this holiday. So that's, uh, that's, that's what we did for, that's what I did for that holiday. That's wonderful. Uh, so while we're talking about your photos, let's talk about your photos because this is just a simple little branch off a rose bush, right? Yeah. And well, you know, that's the beauty of a macro lens. And um, I always carry two lenses with me. I, I use um, just a Canon Rebel. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a heavy camera and I'm still learning how to use it. But um, when I travel around to restaurants or I'm, you know, meeting with chefs, I always carry two lenses. The macro lens just you know, it allows you to really show the beauty of the detail. And, um, and, and that was a rose bush, you know, in the, the dead of January here in Connecticut. So just allowed me to show what was really happening. Yeah. It's a, it's a beautiful picture. I mean, I'm just captivated by this and what, uh, editing do you do on your photos? I use um, aperture on my computer for all of my storage and my editing and, um, you know, I just play a little bit with what's going on. I don't, I don't do anything sophisticated. Okay. Yeah. I'm just learning how to take photos also. I would say that's probably one of my weakest points, but it's, it's fascinating. I, I, I absolutely love it. Yeah. It's really fun. Yeah. It's really fun. The, um, restaurant review here, candle 79 lights the way. And here again, is this your photo? This is not my photo. Okay. And this post was a little complex. I mean, every, as any blogger will tell you, every post presents its own set of circumstances. Um, Candle 79 is uh, part of a, a trio of restaurants, vegan restaurants in New York City that have been around for a good long while. I mean, I think 13 years. And they're really mainstays of the vegan scene in New York. And for a kosher keeper who honors the rules like I do, it's a great situation because I can go into this restaurant and eat absolutely everything. So I love eating in vegetarian and kosher restaurants. Um, the challenge is for the challenge was for this post that, um, I took some of the photographs and, uh, you'll see the food photographs, um, as you scroll through our, our pictures that I took but the interior pictures, um, I couldn't really get. And, and so I asked them if I could borrow them along with a recipe. And it took about two weeks to get permission from the restaurant and to get to the publisher and to get all of that cleared. So, um, you know, as much as a type A blogger organizes her editorial schedule, <laughs> there are always delays and, and sometimes disappointments, but, um, but the interior and the exterior shot are uh, were kindly lent to me by them. And certainly the experience at the restaurant must have been exquisite. The it is exquisite. Yeah. And I'm, I'm at that restaurant probably once a week because they also have a, a second, well, they have three restaurants, as I mentioned, but they also have a cafe called Candle Cafe where they have a counter. So if I'm writing during the day, I just, you know, take a nice walk over there and hang out at the counter and eat whatever yeah. I want. I love their food. Yeah, beautiful. And they have a cookbook. They have a great cookbook. And I love writing about cookbooks too. Mm. Um, yeah, you, and, uh, you do have a cookbook. Let me get Yeah, the to next, the next post that you're about to just keep mm -hmm. scrolling. Yeah. Trust this um, cooking coach. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is uh, the eighth book by a kosher cookbook author named Susie Fishbein. She's a, just a regular American cook, home cook, 
who started cooking um, for friends and starting doing demos. That's Susie in her kitchen with a nice big piece of salmon. Beautiful. And uh, she started doing demos all, all over the country. And, and she was really making kosher food that was much more reflective of the way healthy contemporary eaters eat. And I don't know, you know, everyone has a different association with kosher, but it's not about like braising beef and putting it in a pot and cooking it until it's um, overcooked. Susie's food and the kind of food that I eat, of course, is really fresh, really vibrant seasonal food. So this was Susie's eighth book. And when I got it, I thought to myself, well, you know, I love her books and I have probably four of them, but I mean, what could she be saying that's new? And I had the pleasure of really reviewing, um, looking at it, perusing it with my daughter, who's 22, um, over the course of her Christmas break here at home. And it was her perspective that really helped me to understand how fantastic this book is. And so, um, you know, this is part of the fun, as all bloggers know, is that you know, there are surprises, you know, things that you don't think are thrilling can be thrilling. If you spend enough time really mulling over or doing your research, um, you know, there can be some really fabulous surprises that we encounter, whether it's a meal or a great book or a recipe that you've been given and that you cook and you say, wow, it didn't look so exciting, but it sure is. Yeah, so nice. the surprise How element is something that thrills me. Yeah. How much time do you put into a blog post? <laughs> you know, I watched, I watched, um, one of your other interviews and I, I just, it was the, um, the barbecue guy. He yes. talked a lot about, he talked a lot about, um, pig, which, you know, was so funny for me to be watching. Um, I, I would never have hung in there except that I thought he was so interesting. And he said what I will say, which is it takes a lot longer than it appears to take. I mean, I, I, I spend, I mean, I'm almost embarrassed to say, should I say? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I think that... A few days. Yeah. I, I, it's a few yeah. days. And, you know, I try to break it down because <clears throat> it can get uh, a little bit too intense. So, you know, if I take pictures, I download them. And if I'm kind of tired, I'll use that day to peruse the pictures. And that's really fun and sort of soft activity. And then there's the stuff which requires research. And then I do that. I always work early in the morning and... Um, and I, I always get dressed, fully dressed and work as if I'm going out because I like to be in my really professional, serious mode when I do my work. Oh, good. That's your style. That's excellent. Yeah. yeah. And tell us about this blog post here. Well, this is, you know, probably the most personal post that I've written. Um, there is a, um, there's a website called Beyond Bubby. Um, a bubby is, um, it's the old Yiddish term for grandma. I didn't call my grandmother bubby. I called my grandmother nanny and that is my nanny and that is my grandpa. Wonderful. Um, but I met the, uh, one of the folks who works at this website called beyond bubby and they gather recipes that reflect, um, family recipes and traditions of all sorts. And what they want to do is to preserve them. So I wrote a post about my grandparents and a little bit about my cooking, a little bit about a dinner party I had. And then I showed the recipe that I contributed to Beyond Bubby, which um, I think if you scroll down, I think I included a photograph. Yeah, I included a photograph of myself, my mom in the middle, and my daughter. Mm, along with that recipe. And then those cookies are my daughter's cookies because she's the real baker in the family. <laughs> those look delicious. What's in the center of those cookies? Well, those, um, those are Linzer tarts and those are raspberry jam filled. Oh, wow. And then the other cookies are a traditional Indian butter cookie made with cardamom mm. um, that she made for a special friend um, whose family is from India. And she wanted to bake something special. And then the recipe was the one I contributed to the Beyond Bubby group site. And that mm -hmm. is a reflection of, um, you know, our tradition. Right. Now, uh, Liz, how often do we find your recipes uh, distributed throughout your blog post? Well, I try to attach a recipe at the end of every blog post now. It can be a challenge, as I mm -hmm. said, because mm -hmm. restaurants don't always um, 
want to give up their recipes. And but I do try to attach a recipe at the end of every post. And mm -hmm. the other challenge is that uh, re restaurants don't have recipes uh, scaled to home usage. Yes. So sometimes the chefs are like, oh, come on, Liz, I can't do this. You know, it's just too much. I don't cook for home, you know, for home cooks. Um, and what I learned recently when I posted a re or I, I almost posted a recipe from a restaurant chef was that when they're making the conversions to home scale, sometimes they make mistakes and ultimately it's my responsibility. So I've learned to become, um, you know, a better editor, especially looking at recipes because mistakes are made and then, you know, you want your readers to trust you. Right. Well, and they'll let you know when you're wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, they do. I, I find out all the time because <laughs> I'm, I'm more of a, you know, seat of the pants kind of guy. I just, I wing everything and, and then I just lay it out there for the world and, and they, they correct me quite often. It's fun. Yeah. Well, yeah. Sometimes it's fun. Listen, yeah. if it's done in, in, in the right spirit, it can be a lot of fun. The yeah. exchange with the readers is really fun. Oh yeah, it is. It, well, and it makes it worthwhile doing this. That's right. right. That's right. Yeah. So do you ever have people come up to you in public and say, Hey, I know you, you're Liz. Well, I've had it. I've had um, people do that a couple of times and I always forget that I've put a picture on my about section mm -hmm. on kosher like me, but I recently okay. read, um, well, I always had a picture there. I just felt it was important, but I read recently that it's really important to put a lot of information about yourself on your about section. And the more I, you know, the more sites I look at, the more I agree. I think the more our readers know about us, the more we connect. So, right. Yeah. Hence food blog radio. That's right. Yeah. That's, that's well, that, I, I obviously I agree with you because that's why I'm doing this. I, I love looking at food blogs. I love going through these, but I'm always curious to know, well, you know, tell me about Liz. What, what do I want? You know, I need to know more about Liz. And yeah. So, yeah. Well, I try to make, I try to make some of my posts personal, mm -hmm. but you know, when it's a restaurant review, I don't, I, I really feel that people want to know about the food. I alternate between, you know, restaurant reviews, some product reviews, and that can get a little bit more personal mm -hmm. or events. You know, I love writing about events. And then if I write about that, you know, it's often what my personal experience is at an event. So, um, you know, sometimes it's a little more revealing. Yeah, absolutely. Well, now, yeah. Liz, you also have a weekly newsletter that people can sign up for. Yes. Well, that's, um, it's really just, uh, you know, it's sort of a misnomer, but it's subscribers to my blog just uh, sign up and then they get whatever I've written during the week. I really only post once a week at this time. I'm trying to work towards twice a week, mm -hmm. but the weekly newsletter means that it will come together and only once will it be sent to my subscribers? Because I think that an overloaded inbox is a terrible thing. I so, agree. So yeah, when I, you do a blog so, post, we yeah. get an email that says, Hey, I've got something new for you to read. Um, really it my my, the way it, the way it works for me is I just, re it releases automatically mm -hmm. at like 5 AM on Friday mornings. Okay. So you get a couple of lines, you get a good photograph and hopefully you click in. Nice. And that's, how it works. Yeah. Okay. Well, where else can we find you, Liz? Well, I'm on Twitter mm -hmm. at kosher like me. And I'm on Facebook at kosher like me. And, um, I'm on Pinterest, oh, which I love, okay. which I think is hysterical and such a time sucker. I mean, <laughs> you know, like if you yeah. don't want to get your work done, go to Pinterest. Yeah. Um, although I do enjoy seeing other people's information and, and images there. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is my Facebook page and, um, you know, sometimes I use it to promote my own work, but I also like sharing information from other like-minded readers and eaters. Um, you know, this, this, uh, delicious jammy cookie that's, that's the top post there was something that I picked up off another site this morning mm -hmm. and, you know, I'm sure she's happy. I posted it on my Facebook page and, and my readers are happy to see it too. Yeah, so. absolutely. And you do have some good interaction here from your fans, which is really nice. Yeah. I mean, I think that building, building the fan base and, oh, that was a fantastic event. That was, 
um, that was the kosher food and wine experience in New York City at mm. Chelsea Piers the other night. You see this very young, very talented caterer um, frantically trying to crank out enough samples for uh, a, a hungry crowd. There were throngs, I mean, thousands of people wow. um, coming to sample kosher food in, you know, probably the largest uh, concentration of kosher keepers uh, in the United States, other than LA is, you know, New York city. So there's a big audience for, for big events. And that was one of them. Hmm. Well, Liz, we are running up on our time here. And what would you like to leave us with as far as a parting thoughts or parting thought? (laughs) I would just say that I think that, uh, Building the blogger community uh, is a great thing. And I hope that uh, people who are listening to this and, uh, you know, who are other bloggers and who are just curious eaters also will really scoot around and look at blogs that you might not necessarily think would be of interest to you because uh, just like I was listening to the, to the radio post from your barbecue guy who was talking about his roasted pork, you know, we learn stuff. We learn such interesting things about other traditions and also about technique, of course, from reading and listening to other bloggers. So I hope people will check me out. Great. Well, I'm sure they will. I certainly will be back again and again. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Lovely blog. Uh, You're a lovely person. Thank you so much for giving up your time to share with all of us. My pleasure. Yeah, Thank yeah, you. Yeah, and absolutely. Good, good luck with your project. I love what you're doing, Gary. Keep it up. Well, thank you. I will, indeed. Got a lot I'll going on. I'll be spreading the word, too. Great. Thank you, Liz. Take care. Okay. You, too. Bye.